Uh, hey everyone, this is Kevin the Christian. Uh, today I want to talk a bit about the Divine Council, uh, specifically the Divine Council's constitution and revelation and what we can learn from the specific numbers which are given to us in Revelation and how we can look at those numbers and kind of understand the structure of the Council in a better way. So the first thing to say is what is the Divine Council? Uh, the Divine Council is what uh, many scholars call the um, gathering of heavenly beings around God where in God's throne room from where he governs and judges the world. These heavenly beings advise God in a certain way. They, God asks them, what shall I do? And they say, well, why don't you do this? And another one would say, why don't you do this? We see a scene of the heavenly council uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah is brought into the temple, because remember the word temple just means palace. The palace is God's heavenly courtroom. So when Isaiah enters the temple and he sees a vision of the heavenly reality that is manifested there, uh, it is a vision of the heavenly council or the heavenly court. Uh, so Isaiah goes into the heavenly council and God says, whom shall I send? Uh, Isaiah is commissioned as a prophet uh, and he says, send me because a prophet is a member of the heavenly council. He is a friend to whom, in the uh, words of Jesus, he is a friend to whom the master of the house has told everything so that he can become wise and give wise counsel. Mm -hmm. Now in the Old Testament, uh, uh, the devil and his fallen angels were part of this governing body. Um, God created the world in its spiritual childhood under the tutelage of angels. These angels were meant to train up uh, man to maturity so that man would eventually become crowned with glory and honor and be a worthy vessel for the incarnation of the word by whom man would be crowned. Uh, James Jordan likes to say that angels were uh, heavenly drill sergeants for men in that they would train humanity throughout the old covenant, but eventually the drill sergeants themselves would have to um, swear loyalty to these men who had been trained and crowned. But uh, as we know, uh, Satan rebelled. I believe the actual concrete act of rebellion which he took um, was in Genesis 3, that he, he came uh, to, uh, he came as the head of God's angelic host uh, in order to put a question to Eve so that she would develop in wisdom. God does the same thing in Job 38 uh, through 42. Uh, Eve answered, she said, we shall not eat of this tree, nor neither shall we touch it. And God hadn't explicitly said that you don't touch what you don't eat. But it's a good deduction. Leviticus makes the same deduction. If you're forbidden from taking of a certain thing, you shouldn't gradually step towards taking it and just get a closer look or maybe touch it a little bit. That's a very bad way of going about things. And so Eve has made a deduction and, is, and has taken her first step to growing wiser. And it is at this point where uh, the serpent or the Nakash, this heavenly bright being who is serpentine in appearance as are uh, the other angels, uh, he then uh, engineers a deception of Eve. Adam was standing there with her as we're told in verse 3. Uh, Adam was the one to whom the commandment was directly given. Uh, he was the one uh, to whom the vocation of guarding the garden and his bride was given, but he doesn't step in, he doesn't say anything, which is why Adam's sin is a sin of high-handedness. He knew exactly what he was doing. While Eve, while she sinned, was it was a sin of deception. There were legitimate uh, reasons for uh, confusion. Um, it's probable that Adam wanted to see uh, uh, what would happen. If Eve disobeyed the commandment, he thought, well, is the serpent right? Is God lying to us? Well, I don't want to test it out for myself. I'm going to put it in my wife. You're, he's using his wife as a human shield, um, which is really a uh, quite a cowardly thing to do, which is why the Bible treats cowardice as such a serious sin. I think in modern society, we don't think cowardice is that serious of a, of a sin. Yeah, it's kind of distasteful, but, you know, whatever. Uh, but in the Bible, cowards are among those who are specifically named as having their inheritance in eternal damnation. And I think one of the kind of biblical roots goes back to Adam's relationship with Eve in the Garden of Eden. He, he repented afterwards, both of them did, which is why um, they're revered as saints uh, today in the Orthodox Church. Anyway, I got on kind of a tangent there. But Satan was the uh, uh, one of God's chief angels. 
uh, he rebelled against God because he wanted that position of exaltation forever. He didn't want man to be crowned with glory and honor, which is why when Eve started to become wise, that is when he decided to deceive her because he was afraid that she would continue becoming wise as she would and then be crowned with glory and honor and supersede uh, the angels who were the temporary governors of the old creation. Uh, Genesis 6, 1-4 uh, records an incident with the sons of God and the daughters of man. The sons of God are members of the heavenly council, uh, and they, this is their kind of concrete act of rebellion. Uh, the relationship of angels to time is kind of an interesting question, uh, but I'm not saying that this is where they, uh, they were good and they were singing praises of God beforehand uh, and that they had no intention of doing it, but they just decided out of the blue uh, about a thousand years after the creation of the world. Uh, I'm saying it may be well true that they formed this intention in their heart at the moment of their creation, but it was uh, definitively realized in uh, this incident in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Uh, the reason that they're doing this is twofold. Well, first, uh, we're given the uh, chronology and genealogy of the line of Seth in Genesis 5, right after we're told about the might and military power of the civilization of Cain. So the line of Seth is understandably afraid, and we are told that the daughters of Adam, and I think that goes back to uh, the named Adam of Genesis 5.1, this is the covenant line, and the fact that throughout the text, these patriarchs are said, of have, um, said to have many other sons and daughters. So these are the daughters of the covenant line, and they are given in marriage to, um, uh, to these sons of God to these fallen heavenly beings. Um, we're told that uh, these sons of God had any that they chose. In other words, this was an enthusiastic deal that was being cut. This is, if you look at its relationship with other texts in scripture, it's a marriage alliance. So you go to Genesis chapter 12, uh, the same kind of language is used. Pharaoh saw that Sarai was beautiful, or literally that she was good. It's the same language used in the tree of knowledge, and he seized her. Why did he seize her? Because Abraham is a prince. Uh, his, uh, it says he saw that she was good. That doesn't just mean physically beautiful. It means this would be a great marriage alliance. You want to cut a deal with the most powerful um, states in the region. Well, Abram was a prince from the land of Ur. Sarai means princess. I mean, and that really means that they were royalty. Um, they were very wealthy and powerful people. Uh, so Pharaoh wants to extend his dominion. Uh, over the land. And the way that he extends his dominion is by cutting a marriage alliance uh, with Abram's um, sister. Um, uh, and so this is what you see in Genesis chapter 6. There is a double seizure of dominion. On the one hand, the line of Seth was terrified of the line of Cain, and they wanted a marriage alliance with these fallen angels in order to produce what the text calls mighty men, conquerors, who are able to repulse the uh, uh, invading Cainite armies, presumably. You have to do a little reading between the lines, but this reading actually, when you look at it and you compare it with what uh, explicitly is described in the history of Israel, it rolls together very, very well. Uh, so they're afraid. They cut this marriage alliance. They produce the Nephilim, the mighty men, the conquerors. Um, Goliath, for example, is a Nephilim. I'm not going to get into the ontology of that at this point. Uh, I'll talk about that at, in another series of videos because uh, I have a particular interest in this text and kind of working it out both biblically, theologically, and ontologically. Um, so anyway, uh, so there's a uh, attempt to seize dominion by the line of Seth. They want to exalt themselves before God is ready to give them in the world. The same sin of Adam. Adam wanted to exalt himself, become king by eating the tree of kingship tree of wisdom, which is what the tree of knowledge of good and evil means. First Kings 3, knowledge of good and evil is kingship. Um, but also it goes the other way as well. Uh, the fallen angels wanted dominion. Uh, when Eve saw that the tree was good, she saw that it was good for what? For being exalted to kingship, for becoming wise. Becoming wise is always associated with the scripture. Uh, Solomon says in Proverbs that kings rule by wisdom. Wisdom is learning to rule properly. She saw that the tree was good for becoming wise, for exalting herself, for taking dominion. And so when the fallen angels are described as having the same thought as Eve, it means that they also want to have dominion. This is why I think tradition says that the reason for the rebellion of Satan and the fallen angels uh, was because they did not want man to be exalted 
over them. And that was the promise from the very beginning, that the uh, uh, angelic hosts would serve as temporary governors of creation, but ultimately man would have to be crowned and given the keys to the kingdom uh, afterwards. But because of man's unique role in the creation, both Satan and these fallen angels know that the way to get the keys to the world, to get the keys to the kingdom, to get the permanent government of the world, you have to go through men. And so that is the project that one sees here. Satan can't produce kids by himself. Satan can't take dominion by himself. He has to go through the covenant people. So you have those fallen angels there. Then in Genesis chapter um, 11, we have the Tower of Babel. This is also associated with the Heavenly Council. They build a tower up to heaven. They build a tower up to heaven. They want to exalt themselves to the heavenly council. Uh, and also, this is the way for the fallen angelic armies to seize control of the world. By uniting the world by blood, Nimrod was a mighty slaughterer before the, uh, for the Lord. He's also described for, as a mighty man, which is the same word that is used to describe the Nephilim. Um, I doubt that he was actually a Nephilim, but there's a literary association going on there. So it's about this false union that you see between the fallen angels who are trying to seize control and also humankind who wants to seize control uh, before it is their time. Uh, and uh, when God scatters the nations, uh, he uses the um, plural address. Now, if you look at texts like Isaiah 6 um, what you, and 1 Kings 22, when God says something like, let us, he is addressing his heavenly council. This is a session of his heavenly court, and he is inviting that council to um, enact what he has called for. Uh, that council in the Old Testament, as I said, includes fallen angels, which is why in 1 Kings 22, you see an evil spirit in the midst of God's counsel. They hadn't yet been expelled. So when God says, let us, this includes the fallen angels. This is the lesson of Job. Even those who are rebels against God are ultimately servants to his providential purpose. To understand the role that they play here, you have to understand uh, the distinction between language and lip. Uh, the uh, Babylon narrative is not just about a tower. It is also about a city. It is not also, it's not only about language, it is also about lip. So the tower, a funny tidbit here, you know, source critics, uh, you know, the guys who think that the Old Testament was compiled out of a million different sources, uh, they have actually suggested that this is a combination of a tower narrative on the one hand and a city narrative on the other. Um, that's just how um, intellectually dull these theories are. I mean, come on. Um, Give me a break. Anyway, that was a, a bit of a side note. Uh, but the, uh, so this is about cult and culture. Civilization always flows out of the church. It always flows out of the people of God. There is a river flowing out of the uh, temple, which sanctifies the whole city, which sanctifies the whole civilization. Likewise, if you have idolatry, that is going to corrupt your whole civilization. So in the book of Judges, when Israel goes after idols, God does uh, what is natural to do. He says, okay, you want to worship these gods? I'm going to give you uh, the culture of these gods. And they come in, and they are these idolatrous nations which come in, they rule over them. And Israel says, wow, actually uh, worshiping these gods doesn't really produce a thriving and peaceful culture. And then God rescues them through the judge anointed with the spirit. So there's an association between cult and culture that's really fundamental to uh, the teaching of the scriptures. Um, uh, the cult corresponds to the tower. Uh, the tower is a ladder to heaven. It is the place where heaven and earth is meant to be linked together. Uh, that is the function of the temple. Uh, the temple is where God's heavenly count, uh, council or heavenly court is manifested in the world. It is the uh, link between heaven and earth, and that's what's going on in the tower here. It's a ladder to heaven. Uh, the city is, of course, the city of Babylon, whose culture and character is uh, constituted by its idolatry. And then in terms of language and lip, language refers to the city. Uh, this is the uh, just what we would speak of as English and Spanish. It's just the tongue of your particular nationality. And language is very important because uh, if you share a common language, there is extensive cultural flow which occurs. So uh, the United States, England, and Australia 
I have friends from England and Australia. There is no culture shock if one moves from one place to another. Why? We read the same books because it's all in English. We watch the same, in uh, many cases, television shows because it's in English. We watch the same films because it's in English. And in participating in this collective culture, our kind of self-identity and our character and modes of thinking are shaped together. Whereas another nation, which has a different language, has a different culture. There are books that are written in Spanish that I can't read, and I will probably never read those books written in Spanish. There are movies that are done in Spanish, which Spanish-speaking peoples can all see, but English-speaking people are cut out from that. Of course, there's engagement, and there's interaction between uh, the various national families, but the centrality of language to national identity really should not be understated. It's very, very important. And God wants many tongues, many languages, all praising God with one voice, because God is one in nature, but he's three in person. There is unity, and there is also diversity. God wants to create a single, united, and glorified human family, but where each person retains his or her own absolutely distinct identity. Many languages, but one lip. So this is not often noted, and of course I got this from, who else? James Jordan. Uh, the lip is a way of referring to the God you confess. Uh, if you want proof for this, look in the Psalms. David says, uh, about uh, idolatrous gods, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. And if you do a word study of this phrase lip throughout the Bible, you're going to see that it is consistently associated with one's altar, which God you worship and how you worship him. Isaiah 19, for example, when it speaks of the conversion of the nations, it says that four cities will speak the lip of Canaan, and in this case it's speaking of the land of Canaan, which is inhabited by restored Israel, and one of those cities is going to be destroyed. Uh, this is the same prophecy which speaks of the conversion and blessing of Egypt and Assyria, the two peoples who uh, had uh, oppressed uh, Israel, uh, Egypt having oppressed Israel uh, in the book of Exodus, and Assyria being the power which was invading uh, the northern kingdom and coming to the southern kingdom. As well. They will be united and joined together and blessed with Israel when Israel is a blessing on the earth. But there are these four out of five cities which swear the lip of Canaan and profess the name of the Lord. That's a kind of reference back to Genesis where there are five cities of the plain and four of them are destroyed in the uh, burning of Sodom and Gomorrah. Only one is spared. The point of the prophecy is that under the new covenant, under the kingdom of Christ, which progressively develops and expands throughout history, and it is by no means done expanding and discipling the nations, under the kingdom of Christ, that pattern is reversed. Over time and throughout history, faithfulness will increase so that, um, relatively speaking, judgment and destruction and rebellion would be the exception rather than the rule. We're a fair bit from that right now, but church history, I, I believe, is long. Um, uh, anyway, so that's lip. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, if you aren't convinced by now, just do a, a word study of it. You're going to see that lip is uh, how you call upon the name of the Lord. And of course, Genesis, uh, the, right after the Babylon narrative, uh, we see that God promises to make Abraham a great name, and then Abraham calls upon the name of the Lord. Uh, and builds an altar where the Gentiles begin to gather, thus beginning the reversal of the curse of Babel. So, to scatter the languages of the people who are united at Babel, uh, that's easy to understand. God creates 70 different language families, which are very, very distinct from each other, and of course those language families continue to multiply and develop throughout history. Uh, but it looks like, as I understand linguistic research, um, in terms of the various languages of the world, there are somewhere around 60 to 70 documented language families. Of course, just a few of those language families dominate the world because uh, as the world ages, uh, smaller peoples just come to assimilate and speak the language of larger peoples. But it's very interesting, the, the, the relationship of Genesis 11 to um, contemporary linguistics. And I'm not claiming to be an expert, and I might be talking out of my butt, um, but I just thought that was uh, interesting if, uh, if it is sound. Um, don't start an argument in the comments on that. Um, so, uh, 
That's easy. God just creates these different languages. Uh, and he does that in order to break their cultural unity. Uh, God had wanted man to spread over the earth and to exercise dominion over the whole creation. But they shared a common culture that was reinforced by their common language. So they could all speak to each other. And that's a literary feature of the Babel narrative. Lend your strength and let us do this. And we're going to do it together. Um, uh, we're going to do it together. Uh, and God breaks that unity by the diversification of languages. But remember, in Revelation, we see many nations speaking many languages glorifying God. At Pentecost, we don't have the reunification of all languages into one. It is many tongues which confess the name of Jesus Christ. So the diversity of languages was something which would have occurred naturally, even as man separated and spread across the earth if man had obeyed divine commandments. It's not a bad thing. It is something which is preserved uh, throughout the ages. Uh, there are going to be many languages for eternity. But what about the one lip? Well, this is an interesting point because what I think and what and what James Jordan thinks, to whom I'm very much a dependent um, for this discussion, is that the one lip is about one idolatrous religion. So imagine if the entire planet, uh, so imagine if the church uh, was about 5% of humanity, but 95% of humanity professed a single united faith. They confessed, a, uh, they confessed the identical God or gods, and they understood them in the same way, and their culture and practice flowed out of that identical understanding. But what if Christians were 5% of the global population, and the other 95% was each divided into 5% chunks, each of them uh, professing a more or less distinct form of idolatry than the others? Well, in that case, there's much less unity among the uh, idolaters so that at times they fight each other instead of coming against Christianity. And this is what I believe happened in Genesis chapter 11. So why have I gone on this tangent? It's become much more than about Revelation, so sorry, but I hope you enjoy it anyway. Why have I gone on this tangent? Uh, because the understanding that the lip refers to the name of the God that you confess uh, is important for understanding why God addresses his heavenly counsel. In this context, he says, let us and the fallen angels are included in that let us statement. How did the fallen angels operate in carrying out God's command? Well, they appear to different nations and they demand worship from these different idolatrous nations, from these nations who are disobedient and unfaithful to God's commandment. And we should not imagine, I mean, the virtue uh, which inheres eternally in God is perfect love and intercommunion. Um, and perfect concord in mind. Now, just because Satan and the uh, fallen angels have the same goal, we should not imagine that they are uh, uh, particularly exemplary in concord. Uh, your best guess, and I think it would be a pretty good one, is that they're fighting all the time. So it's not that difficult to get the wicked fighting each other. Um, and this is what God does by addressing the heavenly council so that the fallen angels begin to fight one another and they each try to grab their portion of the human race. Now, this is, uh, this is quote, or, um, echoed in Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 is fundamentally about the heavenly council and it's about Israel's calling to replace the fallen angels in the heavenly council. It begins by describing Israel's birth as children of God. And remember, um, members of the heavenly council are described as sons of God because son is the heir of the household. He's the one through whom the father rules and so on. But Israel was born as an infant child and they have to be matured so that they could eventually take over uh, and be enthroned on God's council. Uh, but throughout the text of Deuteronomy 32, Israel rebels, and since you become what you worship, and they worship the golden calf, they become stiff-necked. They're like calves. They're like cows. I credit G.K. Beale uh, for that insight. Uh, but ultimately, God brings them redemption. He vindicates them, and all of the other gods in the heavenly council uh, are forced to do obeisance before the throne of God, because Israel has been avenged. This is a glorified and redeemed Israel, and they have been exalted. But the story of the fallen angels in the heavenly council is, is mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 8-9. Uh, it says when the, uh, uh, I don't have the text actually in front of me, um, but I can tell you pretty much what it says. It says, uh, when uh, God Most High, and remember God Most High is the na Gentile name for God, because the heavens in Genesis 1, they symbolize dominion, they symbolize rule, they symbolize sovereignty. That's where you're going to find all over the world flags have some incorporation of sun, moon, or stars, which is a kind of interesting point. Um, 
uh, so the heavens symbolize sovereignty, uh, God's um, way of relating to the Gentiles under the Noahic covenant is in terms of his creator, uh, his identity as the creator of the world, and thus as the sovereign of the world to whom they owe their allegiance. He is the God of heaven. He is God most high. Uh, we look at other Gentile nations like in China, who do they worship as the supreme transcendent creator God? It is Shang-Ti, the emperor of heaven. So when God Most High divided the nations, when did he divide the nations? He did so in Genesis uh, 10 and 11. Uh, it's possible actually, um, and uh, I can't remember who suggested it, but it comes from a book on idolatry from Christian perspective. Um, maybe I'll think about it later. Um, uh, but uh, it suggests that God divided the nations. He had already arranged them into their specific blocks and commanded them to migrate um, in, uh, in Genesis 10. Uh, he had already said, okay, you, you guys go with you guys, and then you move across the earth. And then Genesis 11 is a specific rebellion against that division of the nations. Um, Genesis 11 is humankind saying, no, we're not going to go in these tribes and these families to these lands. It's possible. Uh, it's not guaranteed, but it's possible. Uh, but we know that the broad context here is Babel. When the Most High divided the nations, he divided them according to the number of the sons of God. So here's the cool thing. Uh, number of the sons of God... Uh, well, I don't know how cool it is, but I think it's, it, it helps to explain the text. Number of the sons of God, uh, that's 70, because God divided the nations according to their number. And in Genesis chapter 10, we are given 70 nations of the world. So why 70? Is this just that God literally has exactly 70 seats on the divine council, and he has 70 sons who sit on those seats? That's what many... Um, uh, uh, non-traditional or critical scholars would say and they would claim that it's borrowed from Near Eastern stuff but that's not true because actually we see language and um, description about the Heavenly Council from all over the world including places far off from the Near East um, so the same kind of situation with flood stories there anyway why 70 well here's my best shot at it and this is not I mean uh, I'm not perfectly satisfied with this this is just a shot uh, seven of course seven goat comes from Genesis chapter 1. Uh, there are seven days representing the fullness of the creation. Uh, I think the number seven is important because the number of God is three, and then the number of creation is four because there are three divine persons, and then standing alongside it is this contingent thing which um, is joined together with God. So those put together are seven, and then actually when you multiply those, those are 12, which is another important biblical number. They sound to you to be kind of uh, on a having a psychotic break um, believe me there's a lot more detail to this and there's a lot more reason to believe that the biblical authors used numbers as a literary device these were not magically coded in without the knowledge of the authors this is an ancient literary device which was known among ancient authors and in the ancient world I think scripture in virtue of its divine inspiration has a particular beauty in its use of those devices but this is nothing uh, magical or crazy or woo woo it's not the Bible code anyway so that's the number seven um, uh, so seven, at the very least, it symbolizes God's sabbatical completion of the creation. Um, uh, you got seven days in Genesis 1. Uh, and then 10, uh, that symbolizes uh, a sense of fullness. And there's a lot more that it symbolizes, but I'm saying this is my best shot uh, at the moment. Uh, seven and 10 are actually both found in Genesis 1 because God is described... Uh, uh, there are 10 creative acts of God in Genesis 1, if I recall correctly. I'm, I'm very confident that that's the case. 10 creative acts of God done in seven days, if you include the seventh, which is the sabbatical uh, rest of God. So what we can get here is that 70 is a way of describing the fullness of the world and the fullness of its governance. Because what does God do in Genesis 1? Uh, we don't just see the world set forth. We see God creating the world. And he creates the world by his word. And he creates man by addressing his heavenly counsel. Now, I do think this is a definitive reference to the Trinity. I'll talk about the kind of uh, conjunction of divine counsel and Trinitarian themes some other time, but I am not denying that this is a reference to the Trinity. Um, but it is, it does have heavenly counsel uh, connotations, um, and 
just as uh, members of the Heavenly Council are prophets, and prophets create new worlds by their words alone. Uh, that's the way God's acting here, and the 70 uh, corresponds to these kind of series of actions done in order to create the world, and the mission of God in his government of the world is to exalt the world and glorify it through his creative vessels, and that is principally done uh, through the Heavenly Council, which is God's courtroom. Uh, the church is now incorporated into the heavenly council. Paul says we are seated in heaven with Christ. Um, uh, so that's why I think it is 70. Uh, uh, 70 in terms of its symbolic connotations, it's clear that the number of the divine council is 70. A couple of other tidbits on 70 in the divine council in the Pentateuch. Uh, uh, first one I want to point to is Exodus 24. Um, in Exodus 24, um, uh, Israel is going to ritually confirm the covenant, and they do so through their representatives. So there are 70 elders of Israel. An elder is someone who has grown up. Their hair is white because they are glorified. Um, that's the symbolism there. Hair is white because they are glorified. They are prepared in wisdom to rule with God. Uh, and uh, as friends of God, as friends at God's throne, friend means a counselor to the king in John chapter 14 and elsewhere. As friends of God, they sit down with him and eat a common meal. So you're going to see this ritual meal sealing the covenant in Exodus 24. You see the same thing spoken of prophetically about the marriage supper of the Lamb in Isaiah 25. And this is why Jesus calls the apostles his friends when he's celebrating the Last Supper, when he's celebrating the First Eucharist. There's a very important connection that goes through all of this. Um, anyway, so remember the Divine Council is associated with um, a covenantal festival. It's, it's, it helps illumine a lot, thing, a lot of things uh, in the scripture. So you see 70 elders there in um, uh, Exodus 24. Remember Jacob had ultimately at the end of Genesis 70 sons. Uh, Israel is meant to be the rebirth of the human race. He's a microcosm of the whole family of Adam. Uh, and then Exodus 24, you've got the uh, covenant where God's glory comes and dwells on Mount Sinai, and you have a sign of the ultimate exaltation of Israel to God's counsel. Though it's very important to note, very important to note, um, that they do, uh, that except for Moses, except for Moses, they do not ascend to the top of Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai, as, are any, as is any holy mountain in the Bible, has a triple structure. It is a sign of the temple of God. And actually, if you look at um, uh, the dimensions of Revelation, of the city of Temple of Revelation 21, uh, and, you, uh, uh, and you account for the fact that there's a river of life flowing and that has to flow downwards, it can't be a cube, uh, that's a pyramid. Um, the only two things that are architecturally compatible with the dimensions given in Revelation 21 are a cube and a pyramid. And the fact that water flows down in that city temple means that it is a pyramid. So it is a holy mountain. And the temple is a holy mountain. Daniel envisions in Daniel chapter 2 a, uh, uh, a stone cut without hands, which is the way of describing an altar in Exodus 20, um, breaking all the kingdoms of the world, and becoming a holy mountain. It grows up into the mountain of God, which is the kingdom of Christ. So mountains are temples. They have the same kind of architectural um, correspondences as a temple or a tabernacle. Uh, the top of Mount Sinai is where God's glory is dwelling. Uh, that corresponds to the Holy of Holies, where God in his glory uh, inhabits the Holy of Holies as his divine throne room. Moses goes up into that cloud and experiences divinization uh, directly with God. One of the ways to know how he's experiencing divinization is very interesting. When he goes up to renew the covenant and he again sees God's glory, he comes down the mountain and what happens? He comes down, he's shining with glory and Israel is afraid and they draw back. And then Moses has to veil his face. Well, that's what happened with God in Exodus chapter 20. God's glory came down on Sinai. Israel was afraid. They drew back and they said, okay, we need a veil between us. So he, they sent up Moses as a mediator. Kind of an interesting bonus tidbit there. Um, um, and then there is the midpoint of the mountain, um, where, uh, uh, which corresponds to the holy place. And the holy place in the tabernacle in the temple has the uh, bread of the presence, the 12 loaves, which symbolize Israel. It has got the uh, seven branch lampstand, which symbolizes the sun, moon, and the five visible moving planets. Um, it's got the incense altar and so on. 
Uh, and then you've got the bottom of the mountain, and it is, uh, and it has a fence around it. And if you enter into that fence, you're going to be shot. Um, that's what the Levites do. If you look at the regulations in the Book of Numbers, uh, the Levites uh, are commanded to shoot anyone who enters into sacred ground, which they are not uh, supposed to do. Um, the same regulation is around Sinai because it is a temple of God. It's a temple mountain. So it is the middle of the holy mountain where the uh, uh, festival of God's heavenly court occurs. Uh, and above that, they see a blue sea of crystal. And above that, they saw the God of Israel. So they are below the God of Israel right now. They're not on the same layer. Uh, we see in Genesis 1, there is a firmament which bounds God's heavenly court uh, from our material cosmos. Below the firmament, there is uh, the sun, moon, stars, uh, and what we call outer space. And then below that, uh, we've got Earth, or if you are on any other planet one day, um, it's the same kind of situation. These little bubbles in God's heaven which sail through um, uh, the heaven of God. Um, um, where was I? Oh yeah, the Psalms also speak, by the way, of water above the heavens. That is how we know that the firmament is not identical to the blue sky. And actually we see that as well in uh, the structure of the tabernacle where you have um, a... Uh, a ritual bowl of water standing outside the tabernacle, which does signify our blue sky. But then you, and you go past that and you see uh, the sun, moon, and the five moving planets. This is the starry heavens. You go past that and there's another veil, which symbolizes the firmament. You go past that and you enter into God's throne room. Right. So there are waters above the heavens, according to biblical cosmology, which I will not be talking about in concrete terms, except to say that, yes, I do believe um, in biblical cosmology, and no, that doesn't mean I'm a flat earther. So don't comment on that, because it would just start a whole tangent. Uh, maybe I'll make a video on it one day. Uh, so the festal meal of the Divine Council is taking place below the, uh, uh, the blue... Um, ceiling, so to speak, which symbolizes the Sea of Crystal, the firmament of God, which bounds God's throne room from us. They have not yet been exalted to the top of the holy mountain. Then there's another instance of 70 in uh, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, that is 70 elders. It's in Numbers 11 to 12. Now, Numbers 11 to 12, um, Israel is kind of getting sick of their diet. Uh, they want other food. Uh, this is infuriating uh, and kind of a ridiculous complaint given all that had occurred, but you know what? I'd probably make the same complaint. One of the things the Pentateuch teaches us is when push comes to shove and God has done a mighty act before us, it's really cool for about an hour or about a year maybe. Um, but then we start getting bogged down by really, really, really petty stuff, and it's the petty stuff which is most dangerous because it's the stuff we don't think is serious. Um, that's the kind of the... Um, what would you call it? The uh, tropological dimension to scripture? Or is tropological the end of thing? Okay, I don't know. But the moral dimension of scripture. Um, one of the many lessons it teaches us. The Old Testament is full of practical wisdom. Um, anyway, so uh, then Moses says he cannot bear with this people alone. He says, have I borne them? Have I nursed them? Have I carried them in my womb? And the implication is obviously no. He's speaking to God. God is the divine parent of Israel. God is the one who was nursed and born and carried them in his womb. So we are talking about God's children in this case. Uh, and that's important because, remember, the heavenly council is what? The sons of God. So what do you see in Numbers 11 to 12? You have 70 elders. Okay, number of the heavenly council. The spirit of God is put upon those 70 elders. Um... Uh, remember, the Spirit of God is that which constitutes a prophet. A prophet is one who has the Spirit, and uh, if the Spirit indwells a person, he's a prophet. And a prophet is the member of the Divine Council, because the Spirit constitutes the glory cloud in which God's counsel um, exists and is in session. He facilitates communion among persons. Um, uh, so the putting on the Spirit and making the 70 elders prophets and putting them in the Heavenly Council, that's all linked very closely together. Um, and the important point I wanted to make there was the connection of uh, this divine council in Numbers uh, 11 to 12 with the concept of God's children, the sons of God. And it's kind of this conceptual backdrop which undergirds Deuteronomy 32. Because remember, you, if you are supposed to read Deuteronomy 32 having digested the rest of the Pentateuch. 
If you just go to Deuteronomy 32 and just read it as one of a smattering of passages, or maybe even the, one of the first passages, it, you're not going to get anywhere. But if you are familiar with the common words and phrases of the Pentateuch uh, and the theological themes and the narrative of the Pentateuch, then you begin uh, you begin to see... That's my dog, by the way. Hello, Tucker. Um, uh, then you begin to see how it all kind of works and how it holds together. Um, so, you know what? I haven't even gotten to Revelation here, except perhaps, perhaps marginally. This video is not about uh, the Divine Council and Revelation. It looks like this is going to be maybe a two or three part series on the Divine Council in the scriptures. So that's going to end today's clip of that. And I um, um, very much appreciate you watching.